Warren Hunter, evangelist with a mission, demonstrating signs and wonders decently in order by the power of the Holy Spirit, speaking the truth in revival, piercing the innermost being. Now let's take you live to a revival meeting where you will be moved from one level of glory to another. We're talking about Acts 13, verse 23. God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus. Now, I want, I want to look at two uh, different scripture verses. First, just so we, before we start this, I want to go to Isaiah chapter 9 because they understood these were prophecies. So what he's doing is he's basically confirming something a prophecy saying, okay, if you know the word and you know the promise, the promise was brought to Israel. What was that promise? This is what we look at. Paul's audience knew the prophecies that God would raise up a greater seed to David. Where we see this promise is in Isaiah uh, chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9. We're going to look at a couple of these things. Isaiah chapter 9. And verses 6 and 7, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his, a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, the government will rest upon his shoulders, his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace, and there will be no end to the increase of his government. So they're prophesying of the birth and the reign of the Prince of Peace. The whole of Isaiah is doing this. It's prophesying of the birth of the rain. So they, there had to be a birth. And then Isaiah chapter 11, we see some more of this prophecy in Isaiah chapter 11, 1 through 5. Then a shoot, a shoot will spring forth, a descendant basically, from the stem of Jesse. Remember Jesse had David and so forth and so forth, the genealogy, amen. The spirit of the Lord will rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom, understanding, spirit of count, strength, the spirit of the knowledge, spirit of the fear of the Lord. He will be a delight in the fear of the Lord. He will, he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what his eyes see. He will make a decision by what his, he will make a decision by what his ears hear. But with the righteousness, with righteousness, he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips. He will slay the wicked, remove the wicked. Also righteousness will be the belt about his loins, and faithfulness a belt around his waist. And if you remember my message I preached the other day about the loins, uh, you can actually connect Jeremiah 13 to that as well. But what we're talking about here is that he would give David a throne to the one whose right it is. Now, he's talking here, let me say again, from the descendants of men, according to promise, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus Christ, a Savior. Now, another verse you have to look at is Ezekiel. I want you to look at Ezekiel chapter 21 and verse 27. Ezekiel 21, uh, 27. Ezekiel 21, 27. Now, in Ezekiel 21, 27, he says that this one, this is such a powerful verse, um, Arun, 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 I will make it. This also will be no more until he comes, until he comes, until he comes, Jesus, whose right it is, and I will give it to him. Till he comes, whose right it is. Amen. Now, there's a really powerful book out there by Kelly Varner called Whose Right It Is. I really encourage you to get that book, read that book. It's called Whose Right It Is by Kelly Varner. Whose right it is? Whose right it is? A covenant theology book talking about whose right it is. Who, who had the right to cut the covenant? Amen. To be the firstborn from the dead. To be the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. It was Jesus. It was his right. He made, him and God made a vow before time again. You will be the lamb slain before the foundation. He will secure the right. Amen. Whose right it is. Now, this is very important, so let's continue here, amen. I'm going back to Acts, uh, let me see, in my Bible, I'm going back to Acts 13 here, because I have so much year that's on this, 
after John had proclaimed before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. After John had first preached before his coming the baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. So one thing we see here is many were sincerely waiting. They were sincerely waiting for the consolation, for the counsel of Israel to come and for redemption to come. So they were waiting for redemption to come. You say, now how do we, we know of this? Two, uh, there's actually several. Let, let's look at this example. They were waiting for redemption to come. I want to look. I'm going to hold my place here in Acts 13, but I want to look. Uh, let's see here uh, at Luke chapter 2. Amen. In Luke chapter 2. And uh, in Luke chapter 2, let me go here. In Luke chapter 2, verse 25, Luke 2.25, it says, this is very good, Luke 2.25. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. Looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Who's with me? So he's looking for the consolation or the consolier of Israel for the redemption to come. Hallelujah. And, and, and it was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he had seen the death before he had seen the Lord Christ. So God revealed to this man, you will see basically the Savior, the one whose right it is, the Redeemer. Hallelujah. Now remember, Paul is basically uh, giving them confirmation. Giving them confirmation. And John fulfilled his call. Uh, and the baptism of John, repentance, telling them to repent, to prepare the way. And um, so we see also in verse 38, it says, And that very moment she came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak of him to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And remember, this was Anna, the daughter of Pilate. This was a prophetess called Anna. And uh, she spoke to them to speak to all. So there was actually an audience there hearing from this prophet, prophetess, and in the temple serving night and day. And she was fasting and praying. And Anna, the prophetess, declared. So there were even some people who heard, hey, wait a second. Boy, he's coming. He's here. He's arrived. Amen. And that very moment she came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. Basically saying, Jesus is here, redemption is here, the fulfillment of prophecies is here. So, so we actually have many, many, uh, how can I say, confirmations. Now you say, why is this important? Because really, you're going to see as we begin to deal with this, to me, this is the root, how can I say, the root of immortality. You say, why? Because this gets down to the essence of where we begin to look at the idea of how powerful this redemption works, how powerful the price Jesus paid, how powerful these prophecies are fulfilled. Uh, when, we, when, we, when we connect scriptures like Habakkuk 1.12, and we say, we will not die, amen? And because he's speaking of everlasting, eternal, amen, life, of how powerful redemption is. So uh, a lot of these things, we begin to connect different prophecies that's literally leading us somewhere in a powerful way to absolute total redemption. Now, I love this because, uh, let me just go a little further here, back to Acts chapter 13 and verse... Uh, 25, and while John was completing his course, he kept saying, what do you suppose that I am? I am not he. Behold, one is coming after me whose feet, or I am not worthy to untie, whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. Basically what this means, to unloose, to take off. He felt he was not worthy to be, how can I say, to do the most menial task, a task usually reserved for a slave when a master came into the house the slave was the one who took his sandals off and washed his feet and john was saying i, I don't even feel i'm worthy enough to even do that concerning jesus because he had such high regard and reference uh for who jesus was and paul's literally quoting you know from uh matthew 3 verse 11 as well and he makes this very clear our lives 
uh, remember our lives are uh, another sense. Uh, let me show you this verse, 2 Timothy 4, 7. 2 Timothy 4, 7. In 2 Timothy 4, verse 7, he says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Amen. I have kept the faith. So John was very controversial man but he stayed in that place of humility and this is where it, it leads to really in a powerful way verse 26 we begin to see in verse 26 the second part of the sermon now he's going to begin to lay the foundation here and there's a key foundation i don't want anybody to miss this if we don't get some of the all of this today and we just get some of it today make sure you're listening tomorrow because this revelation gets so deep and so powerful it's incredible men and brethren sons of the family of Abraham and those who fear God to you the word of the salvation has been sent men and brethren sons of the family of Abraham to those now you know this is telling us a whole lot this this is this is saying uh, Paul addresses the Jews uh, in his audience as men and brothers descendants of Abraham descendants of Abraham remember now what happened uh, what God said to Abraham, he's now considering they understood certain things, saying you are descendants of Abraham. So there's certain things you should know what's about to happen. Because remember, the gospel was also preached through Abraham. We see this in his life. We saw this when Steve used the typology of Abraham. We've seen this with the sacrifices of Abraham. We saw Isaac, Abraham sacrificing his own son Isaac on the altar. By faith, Abraham receives received Isaac raised from the dead so as to speak in an inner imagination so he's seen he's seen he's seen he received Isaac this is Hebrews 11 17 and 18 he received Isaac raised from the dead there's a reality picture here a revelatory picture here of seeing a resurrection power in manifestation in the future Amen. Concerning the fact that he's on Mount Moriah, the very place where Jesus is going to die and shed his blood for all of humanity. Hebrews 2.14 and destroy him who had past tense the power of death that is the devil. And here at that moment, Abraham's in that same place, same thing. And he's receiving Isaac raised from the dead. So almost looking into the future to see Isaac raised from the dead, so as to speak. Uh, raised in an inner imagination. Now you say, what's that very important? Because that, that is a key element to perceiving uh, the potential of life, uh, to tapping into the reality of life. One time I did a series on Abraham, and I just taught on Abraham in relationship to immortality. I actually have like four or five tapes still sitting at home on my shelf from, I don't even know, many, many years ago, just on Abraham and immortality. Now, the reason is I was connecting it through this thing about the lamb slain before the foundation of the world and dealing with Isaac. Now, watch what happens here. Uh, we're talking about something very powerful here, men and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham. What did we say? Uh, I want to look at a verse, Genesis 12, to show you something exactly what they understood, and they knew this very well. Amen. They would know this, these audiences speaking to would know this very clearly. So we also have to understand what does the audience know. And in Genesis 12, verse 3, And I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and you and all the families of the earth will be blessed. You and all the families of the earth, what? Will be blessed. So he says, man and brethren, sons of the family of Abraham. That means sons of the blessed. Amen. Sons of the blessed. Hallelujah. Sons of the blessed. Amen. Sons of the blessed. Hallelujah. Just check. So watch what he says now. Verse 27. Ready? Verse 27. Now, brethren, sons of Abraham, that means sons of the blessed. You know you've been blessed. You know the blessings of Abraham. And those among you, now who's going to be that blessing in manifestation? Jesus. I mean, there is a blessing in manifestation there in Jesus as well. So, men and brethren, Jewish children, Paul is addressing both Jews and Gentiles and those among them who already believed. And he's, he's, so remember, his audience was varied, like we said yesterday. His audience was diverse. Verse 27. For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers and their rulers recognize neither him 
nor the utterances of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled these by condemning him. What a big statement. You know, you're talking about talking volumes. Up. Paul warns the people, basically, not to follow the example of the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem who rejected the true Messiah. You understand what he's telling his audience? 500 miles away here in Antioch, you say, let me tell you something. Let me tell you what happened in Jerusalem. A bunch of these leaders who read the Old Testament every week in front of the synagogue, they read the scripture, they read the scripture, they read the scripture, yet the very scripture they read every week in the synagogues foretold, amen, that they would kill the Messiah. So he's basically saying, he's telling his audience here in Antioch, they were reading the scriptures in Jerusalem every week, that telling them the fulfillment of the Messiah, telling them that they would kill the Messiah who's with me, telling them all these things, but yet somehow they could not see it. So he's trying to explain to them exactly what they did, exactly how they carried it out. The results were that these Jerusalem Jews and rulers, uh, which might include uh, also Roman leaders, are saying fulfilling those prophecies by condemning Jesus and handing him over for sentence. Now, one thing I like about this that it says in uh, verse uh, 28, and through... And though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate that he should be put to death. Now, one thing we have to understand here, the trials held here against Jesus were illegal, number one. The whole thing was manipulated because of the times in which it was taking place. The other thing is, was there was no legal evidence against Jesus. Keep in mind, the trial was illegal and there was no legal evidence. So he's trying to prove to them, guess what? Their actions, the trial was illegal. He's telling this audience now in Antioch, the trial was illegal and there was no evidence against him. So he's going to come prove to them the fact that Jesus is the Christ. Now verse 29, let me say, let me say verse 29. Now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, when, and now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from a tree and laid him in the tomb. Big statement, big statement, fulfilled. I do want to say that Jerusalem dwellers fulfilled all the prophecies concerning the death of Messiah the Christ. Um, we can see this. Let me give you just an example of some of the things that we know for a fact was fulfilled because he's trying to say, hey, you, if you study the scripture, it was fulfilled. Now, one thing that we do realize from this writing is what a lot of, a lot of uh, scholars agree, that um, basically uh, Luke was given a synopsis. Does that make sense? He was uh, co- uh, coagulating, let's put it, uh, uh, you know, not saying everything that Paul was saying because they said the sermon here literally went for hours, went a long time. So there's no way a sermon that went for hours could be narrated down here in like, who's with me? 30, 20, 30 verses, amen? Uh, it's going to take more than 20, 30 verses to preach a sermon in hours. So Luke's giving you, how can I say, the essence of the messenger. So you know that, he, that what Luke's saying is he's giving it here, but I'm sure uh, he was giving him a whole lot more evidence in between. But we can see the evidence ourselves. Does that make sense? We can see the evidence and it says, now when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him. Now he might have told all these things that was written concerning them, Amen. Now, so that's why I want to give you a couple of examples of that. Isaiah uh, 50 verse 6, because this paints a good picture for us to understand the foundation being laid here. To me, the foundation being laid here is a root uh, to absolute, total restoration, redemption, reformation, glorification, and immortality. It's literally... Yeah, you see this in this section as we start going through this. You will see this. It's really a root. It's really a root. It's something where I'm beginning to lay the foundation. We're in a transition. This is almost like the first time trying to explain the dynamics and the real power of, how can I say, redemptive realities. is kind of being brought out here in a way. So Isaiah chapter 50. Isaiah chapter 50. Watch this. I want to give this to you. Isaiah chapter 50. And verse 6, and I love this verse, Isaiah 50, verse 6. This is so awesome. Watch this. I gave my back to those who strike me, and my cheeks to those who plucked out my beard, and I did not cover my my face from humiliation and spitting. Well, is that exactly what they did to Jesus? 
Yes, that is exactly what they did to Jesus. Look at Isaiah 53 verse 5. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the chastisement for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging stripes, by his stripes, we are healed. Oh, wow. We can see that all through Scripture, the confirmations of that. Um, uh, and we see this every single time. Look at this, Isaiah 45, verse 23. I'm just sticking with some prophecies in Isaiah Isaiah 45, verse 23, to show you some confirmation or things that he could probably. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone forth from my mouth in righteousness, and I will not turn back, the, that to me every knee will bow, every tongue will swear allegiance. Now we know that from Revelation, he's prophesying again. Further mocking and beating, you know, you can see this of all these uh, prophecies. Remember in Isaiah 53? We were there. Let me just go back in Isaiah 53 for a second. Verse 7. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Was Jesus? Yes. He did not open his mouth. Did he accuse much? Yes. Like a lamb that is led for the slaughter. Who is he? The lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And like a sheep that is silent before the shears. Who is that? Jesus. The spotless lamb. So the typologies, the, the, uh, the, what he's saying here is so powerful. Then we see Jesus is taken to a place outside the city. And this is also fulfilled in Leviticus 16, verse 27, remember. And um, so we see a lot of these prophecies fulfilled. For example, it is mentioned in Hebrew uh, as well, in Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13, 11 says it this way, and we're going to bring up a point here. Hebrews 13, 11, For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place, but by the high priest, as an offering for sin are burnt, are burnt outside the camp. Are burnt what? Outside the camp. So that's why Jesus was crucified outside the city. Now, so you see a lot of these different kind of things, how can I say, being fulfilled. Look at Psalms chapter 22. We're covering a lot here. Psalms 22 verse 16 says, For the dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Whose hands and feet were pierced? Jesus. They pierce my hands and feet. I count, I count all my bones. They look and they stare at me. Whew. This stuff's like some serious, uh, some serious stuff going on here. Who's with me of all these prophecies? Verse 18. They defile my, they divided my garments. Did they do that? This is Psalms 22, verse 18. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Did they do that? They divided Jesus' garments and they cast lots. So this has been prophesied. One prophecy after another just keeps being fulfilled, keeps being fulfilled, keeps being fed. Uh, for example, Deuteronomy. We see this over and over, prophecies being fulfilled. Uh, let me give you another one. Deuteronomy 21, verse 23. Multiple of prophecies being fulfilled. There's something like over a hundred and some different prophecies prophesying of the death of Jesus and the crucifixion of Jesus and what would happen. Amen of how he would die on the cross, how he would come and he would die. Um, Deuteronomy 21, verse 23. And his corpse shall not hang all, all night on the tree, but you shall surely bury him on the same day, for he, for he who is hanged is accursed of God, so that you do not defile your land, which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance. Deuteronomy 21, verse 23, talking about a man hanging on a tree. Amen. Talking about hanging on a tree and then being laid in the tomb. Hallelujah. Hanging on a tree and being laid in the tomb. Then we see this again, for example, in Galatians. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Remember, all the curse was taken upon him on that tree. Having become a curse for us, for he's written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Deuteronomy 21, verse 23. Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Amen. But Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for he's written, Cursed is everyone in order that in Christ Jesus the blessings of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that you would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. You see all the connections here. All the connections here. Amen. So he's making this very clear. 
But God raised him from the dead. Amen. God raised him what? From the dead. But God raised him from the dead. God raised him from the dead. So God always wins. With this, God raised him from the dead. Now this we saw because he's, remember he mentioned this several times. Let me just say something about, uh, give you a couple of verses in relation to the fact that God raised him from the dead. Because we want to, what I want you to see is the identification here as well as a revelation. Remember we have been, uh, how can I say, crucified with him we have been buried with him we are united with him we've been raised with him who's with me so what i mean by that is that absolute identification that's why he says take up your cross daily and follow me in that right so we we want to understand this process and look very carefully at it look in psalms psalms chapter 16 verse 10 Psalm 16, verse 10. We'll look at a couple more verses here. Psalm 16, verse 10. And then we'll, we're going to get into this probably really strong tomorrow. Psalm 16, verse 10. I want you to see this because we're laying a foundation here. Psalm 16, verse 10. But you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Notice that. You will not allow your what? Your Holy One to undergo decay. Corruption. Mort uh, begin to wear away. Now, you will make known to me the path of life. Remember where we at? Look very carefully where I'm at. I am in Psalms chapter 16, 10, 11, and 12. Let me break this down real carefully, real carefully, real carefully. Listen very carefully. For you will not abandon your soul to shield, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. He would not allow him to undergo decay. Hallelujah. Now watch this. Nor will... You will make known to me the path of life. Oh, thank you, Lord. You're making known to me the path of life. And in your presence is fullness of joy. And at your right hand, pleasures forevermore. Are you still there? At your right hand, pleasures forevermore. Hallelujah. Go with me to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. We're going to look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, and I want you to see this, verse 24. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death. God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. God raised him up again, putting an end. Ooh. I told you this thing was about to take on heat. But God raised him from the dead. God raised him from the dead. Keep in mind, yeah, but God raised... I tell you what, let me, let me take you. Uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 24. I want to read this in the Amplified. Just amplify this a little bit to give you a little better picture. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts 2. Now watch this, Acts 2. And I'm going to look at verse 24. But God raised him up, liberated him from the pains of death. And we have been raised with him. Seeing that it was not possible for him to continue to be controlled or retained by death. Can you believe that? Can't be controlled or contained by death. For David says, I saw the Lord always in his presence, but he's right in his pleasure. Therefore, my heart was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will live in hope. Because you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. This was in Acts chapter 2. Remember, we went through this. You have made known to me the ways of life, and you make me full of gladness in your presence. Amen. Then in verse 31, Acts 2, 31, he says, looking ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he would never abandoned at his nor will his flesh undergo decay now one could say that was the root there but he's saying a whole lot in that sense so he goes there i want you to go with me now to ephesians chapter one ephesians chapter one but god raised him from the dead let's just break this part down but god raised him from the dead 
God raised him from the dead. Because we're going to get into this. But God raised him from the dead. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. It's very important to understand this because the root, there's a root here, amen, that is so powerful. Hallelujah. Ephesians chapter 1, and I'm going to take the Amplified again. Ephesians chapter 1, because I want you to look at this very carefully, verse 19. So that you can now understand what is the immeasurable and unlimited and surpassing greatness of his power in and for us who believe as demonstrated in the working of his mighty strength. I like that. Unlimited, surpassing greatness of his power, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority. And power and dominion and every name that is named above every title that can be conferred. Not only in this age, but also in the world to come. And he has put all things on his feet and appointed him, the universal supreme head of the church, the head to exercise through the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This, this, is, this is showing you that that resurrection moving, that life, that, that same power that raised Christ to the Jesus Man being now imparted, amen, into us. We see, for example, remember Romans 8.11. Romans 8.11. Let's just, let's just move this progressively. Uh, when we look at this, Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Romans 8.11. It's good to study this out. Romans 8.11. Look what it says. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, amen, but God raised him from the dead, if, if is the big word here in Romans 8.11. Listen, if you're watching, Romans 8.11, if is a big word. If, if, could be, could not be, maybe, possibly, if, if, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. Remember now, this is not just talking about a little boost or quickening. Amen. What is mortal is subject to death. When I give something mortal, it's not subject to death. So the Greek is really very clear. It gives life to what is mortal. If I give life to something that's mortal, it's no longer mortal. It is now immortal through his spirit who dwells in us. If I bring life to what is mortal, it's no longer mortal. It now becomes immortal because we're talking about the life, that same immortal, eternal, zoe, everlasting, deathless life of God that raised Christ from the dead, so he'll be no longer subject to, to decay. That power that causes Christ now to be, uh, uh, how can I say, an immortalized. Remember, I'm in covenant relationship with an immortal, resurrected man. I am in covenant relationship with an immortal, resurrected man. As he is, so are we in this world. This is where we're going on this. This is where we're going on this. Hallelujah. Let me give you one more verse and we'll stop here. So we just go to verse 30. Amen. 1 Peter 3 verse 18. 1 Peter 3 18. We'll do one more verse. And then we'll carry on from verse 31 tomorrow because we'll begin to break this down. This subject is so powerful and it is absolutely incredible. 1 Peter chapter 3 and I want you to look at verse 18. But grow in the grace, hallelujah, 1 Peter, where am I at? 3, okay, let me do your 1 Peter 3, that's what I wanted, 3.18. 1 Peter 3.18, for Christ also died for the sins once for all. Look at that, Christ died for sins once for all. The just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Hallelujah. Put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Amen. So we have been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Now he's no longer, he, he's alive. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you. He is resurrected, seated at the right hand of the Father. So he said, but God raised him up from the dead. That's a very key point. Because remember, the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you lives in you and this is very important i i did a teaching one time and i really encourage you i do a lot of teachings 
on life, faithful life, graceful life, living out immortality actually is still on Sprecher. But one thing that you want to understand, yeah, and I did a teaching one time, it was very, very important that, that, um, uh, that you understand, how can I say, the connection between this absolute identification with the resurrection of Jesus. Amen. Romans chapter 6. Let me just give you one more verse and we'll stop here for today. Amen. Uh, because much was happening, lots, lots, lot of, lots going on, but let's thank God. Amen. And then we'll break this down a little further. But Romans 6 verse 5 says, For we have become united with him in the likeness of his death. Certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Take time to go look up the Greek on Romans 6 verse 5. Sympateus, really an incredible verse. It's like, it's like, how can I say it? The tree is growing with resurrection power and juice. And I'm the branch connected to the vine, the same power that same power that is keeping Jesus alive now, that same power that conquered death, hell, and the grave and destroyed him who had the power of death, that same juice is flowing into the branch who's with me. So you produce sons who are in covenant relationship with an immortal resurrected man. See, we, you must understand something. Else. We are not after uh, the order of children of God before the cross we are children of God. We become born again, and we're going to deal with this word, what it means to be born again. We have come into relation with Jesus after the cross. So we are born after the resurrected order. Amen. We're not born of a corruptible order. We're not born of corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed through the word of God that lives and abides forever. We are born of an eternal order, born of a resurrected order, Amen. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground, it dies, it dies alone. But if it comes forth, it comes forth what? He's now, Jesus is the firstborn from the dead, the first begotten of many brethren. Amen. Now we are not in covenant relation with Jesus before the cross because the blood's been shed to completely redeem us. We are in covenant relationship with an immortal, resurrected man. As he is, so are we in this world. So you, this word united means it's not like other words for united. It literally means moving, juice, intertwine. You know what I mean? The tree is resurrection. You are plugged into the juice. As this tree of immortality, let's say, grow, so you grow in this complete identification with Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Let me say again, I am in covenant relationship with an immortal, resurrected man as he is. So are we in this world. Anyhow, think about that. Bless you. Love you. Thank you for listening today. I speak the blessings of God over you. In the name of Jesus, connect with us on swordministries.org. We love you today. Thank you for watching. And I pray you were able to catch all this. Thank you. Bless you. Amen. Amen.